This, this uh, message is predicated on the festival that we are in. And uh, this is a season of redemption, which excites me. I, I, I appreciate it, uh, having celebrated this festival and over and over and over and over, and over and the, the ritual of the, that we go through in our homes, which, you know, you clean it upside, inside, all over in our house. Um, there are brown rugs during Passover, which is a big thing if you've ever been to my house. It's a little bit different than Brownman's house. They put some signs say Lachometz. In our house, if there's a brown rug, don't cross that rug with Chometz. You'll clean this room, there's a brown rug. Don't walk over a brown rug. And it goes down to the kitchen. <laughs> Uh, and you can only have hummus in there. It's like we're, you know, it's just, it's just something. We're, we're, it's a very normal, very normal for us. It's something we've done for a long time. We uh, we don't find it a, a burden because we're reasonably adept at doing it. But I, I was contemplating. Somebody asked me, "Are are you sure you got it all?" And I said, "I'm reasonably sure. We're actually some of us are pretty meticulous about this. We don't try to do it in a day." And, uh, but in the season of redemption, uh, there, there, there were both uh, Jewish people there who had not yet accepted the Messiah, and there were Christians who were interested, but somewhat confused about what was going on. And, and uh, they were talking about what does it mean to be redeemed in Messiah, different ways to say that, how we're, we saved how, what is the difference between this, that, and the other thing? We were talking about the 45,000 denominations of Christianity in this country and the different branches of Judaism. And what, did you, what did Jews do who reject the Messiah? How can they have their redemption? And things like that. And, and I was wondering about how, how redeemed are we? How redeemed are we? Because a lot of people think, I said a prayer once, I'm okay. And then they enter the cafeteria of the kingdom where they say, I'll some of this, some of this, none of that. And because I said a prayer once, I can do whatever I want. Or I carry a religious expression. Because I do a religious experience, I can really do anything I want. Because, it, you know, I'm redeemed, so... I'm okay, no matter how I behave. And the story of the Passover, of course, is told in the book of Shemot, of Exodus. The Exodus is about the exit out of Egypt, the land of slavery, but also the land where we became a nation. And one of the fascinating pictures that is drawn for us is if you even 70 people went down and we came out a not only a nation but a mixed multitude because of those who came out with us because they saw the truth of our God. And so we became a nation and God redeemed us as a nation but as we left there was a mixed multitude and we were a mixed multitude in where, till we got to the mountain. We got to the mountain, we dealt with God on the mountain who visited us and established his presence in our midst. And at that time, we became a nation again. We are not called a mixed multitude, even though we came out a mixed multitude. When God shows up, everyone's part of the nation. It's one of the interesting pictures of, of Sinai. And in Exodus 6.6 6 is God explaining to Moses, who is our Redeemer, we have, always, we have always needed somebody to be between us and God. And the first was Moses, whom God used to the most obvious extent. And in Exodus 6.6, 6, God is instructing Moses, therefore, say to B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, I am Adonai. And I will bring them out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
I will deliver you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. There's a whole bunch of things in there. You have to understand we as a nation had never encountered God. We had only heard stories of the patriarchs who had each encountered God all in a very different way and in different stories. But we had never really met God. And so when Moses was going to step in and tell the people, I'm your deliverer, he had to say, by the way, I am Adonai, and point to God. I am God sent me. I am God sent me, which ties to the concepts of the exchange with our patriarchs. It is God who is speaking. He hadn't spoken to us for 400 years. As we sat in slavery, we were aware of him because we cried out to him. He said, I am Adonai. I am here to redeem you. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, which is what they had been whining about. I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. It's a step-by-step process taking us as a lost group of slaves to a mixed multitude of peoples where the God of our fathers, who had been silent for 400 years, shows up to not only bring us out from under the burdens and delivering us from that. He's going to redeem us. He's going to redeem us with an outstretched arm, Zroa. Remember the Seder, Zroa, the shank bone? The Hebrew word zroa, an outstretched arm. And it's it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of, of the arm of God, which to me is very significant. We we have we have a, a zroa on our plate, say our plate, a, a shank bone of a lamb, uh, which is zroa, the arm of God. Even though that's not what it symbolizes. God said, I will redeem you. And he redeemed us as a nation. He redeemed us as a nation. As we were leaving last night, I was talking to some people uh, who, who, who are a little bit Christian, and, I, and they were talking about the, the redemption and how do we know we're redeemed. And, and I used the scripture, I was thinking about it because it was in the message, Philippians 2.12, where God's, God's using... Paul now to try to explain something to the Philippians, a Greek congregation. And he's talking about trying to work it out. And he said, Therefore, my beloved ones, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, he planted that congregation. He was there about three days. In this particular city, he planned that congregation in three days, which is very normal for a congregation. But even now, even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the Bible very clearly teaches that salvation is a free gift that's not of works. It's a free gift. God gives you a free gift, and you're to take that gift of salvation and work it out with fear and trembling. And that's something that's missing in our walk as a redeemed people. Because, see, when God redeems you, the redemption is real. When God saves you, it's very real. But when you have that gift of redemption or salvation, you don't sit there and bask in the understanding 
I am saved and it's not by works and I don't have to do anything and I can do anything I want. He said, no, no, you take that and you work it out with fear and trembling because what happens is when you accept the God of Israel and the Messiah of Israel, you're not buying into anyone's religion, you're buying into God who is the creator God and as we interact with God according to his premises, In his works, we end up, if we choose to be a redeemed person with God, it's a free gift of salvation. Now work it out with fear and trembling. Why? You have entered into a covenant relationship with the creator God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. And he has established a covenant whereby in the new covenant he will actually dwell within us. He takes that really seriously, and you better take it seriously because you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit if you walk according to your own ways and thinks you can do anything you want. How redeemed are you? You see, if you are in a covenant relationship with your God who actually promises to take up residence within you, a fortune to me. Where's the change? If you're not changing, you don't have a relationship with God. God will will rattle your world. God will rattle you out of the brokenness of the world. The world is as broken as it can be. And the brokenness is no longer hidden. The brokenness is in your face. And I'm telling you, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we've got to pay attention to what God is doing and not be distracted by what he is not doing. And it's time to work at our salvation, our redemption with fear and trembling because God takes these things seriously. The psalmist understood that in in Psalm 22, 11, serve Adonai with fear, rejoice with trembling. David, a man after God's own heart who had his own problems in his own life. And he, he showed us as much as anybody how you walk through this world of relationship with God where sometimes it's the most intimate thing and sometimes he's not like even there and sometimes God asks us to do something stupid that we think, I don't understand what that means. You know, go sacrifice your son whom you love. Wait a minute. Or David who does something stupid because he thinks God won't catch him. Serve out a night with fear. Rejoice with trembling. You, you praise God. You worship God as we try to do every Shabbat. But you're paying attention to what you say. When I say, Lord, send your fire, it's like, Lord, send your fire, but make sure we're comfortable. Lord, send your fire so we can feel good. Lord, pour out your spirit, but don't rattle things. Lord, we want all of you, but don't make us uncomfortable. We should be be trembling at the reality of God. God wants to show himself real to us. It's not like we've been sitting in, in slavery for hundreds of years and we've heard about God, but he's sometimes far away. Agatha did a post in the, in the realm I thought it was pretty brilliant about how, how God is like out there and, and no, he's as close as your breath. And so you have to picture, how do you picture God? Do you, is, picture God is somewhere way out there or do you, is he as close as your breath, which, which is like Agatha, what Agatha put in there. You know, God's with you whether you act like it or not. When you don't act like it, you're grieving the Holy Spirit because you're not trembling. You're not working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And you have to, I just have, you have to think about this in this festival of redemption. How redeemed are you? You believe the devils believe. You got to work this out. You got to walk this out. I want to walk with God, but I want to stay in the world. I want to walk like the world. I don't want to offend people who are lost. And I say, you know what? If people are offended by the Spirit of God within me, I am successful. 
if people accept, accept me as one of the boys who doesn't stand up for much, I am a failure. When I go out to the gym and, and public and that, people can't come up and start saying something that's worldly and obnoxious. They, say, they know not to do that because it's unacceptable to me. I, I have to walk a life separated from the world. I have to live a life separated to God. I am redeemed and I have to work that with fear and trembling. Now I love God with a passion that surpasses any passion I have for my bride or my children or my grandchildren or all of you. It's a passion that's all encompassing and I work practicing the presence of God. Serve on and I with fear Rejoice, you know, it's serve and rejoice with fear and trembling. Yes, we should serve. When the praise and worship team is up there, they are serving. Are they serving with fear and trembling because they're leading worship and God inhabits the praises of his people? Are they taking this seriously? We hope they are. When you're out there singing, burning me, burning me, burning me. Do you really want God to burn in you? Do you, do you really want that? The, the prophet Isaiah, Yeshua, in a time of separation, wrote to us, Adonai's vault, the warrior title of God and word of hosts. We were separated. Whenever God calls himself Adonai's vault, it means he's not happy with us. Uh, better have some more comfortable names than that, but... Whenever, anytime he says Adonai's vote, which is translated in English Bible, Lord of Hosts, it's a warrior title. God is talking to us, but he's not happy with us. And here's the message to Israel at the time, because Israel still the chosen people, but they are estranged from God. They have a form of godliness, but, the, but deny the power thereof. Him you will sanctify, and let him be your fear trembling at him. Him you will sanctify. You're walking around like you're not even in a covenant relationship with God. That was the charge that the prophet Isaiah gave to us. We are walking around like we're not in covenant with God. And the prophet says, God, you will, you will sanctify and let God be your fear, trembling at him. You're out running around like a harlot, Isaiah said to us. You are in covenant relationship with God. How can you be covenant in covenant relationship with God and walk according to worldly standards? How can you covenant and bind yourself to a worldly situation where you where you live, where you work, where you where you abide, you you get unequally yoked with God and with your, with, with your, with in mammon, which is God in money. You know, I, I have my job. I don't have time for God. I have to do this. I don't have time for God. And, and, and as, as, as Rabbi uh, Robert Solomon used to say, if you, if you don't have God, if you're too busy for, for God, you're too busy. Because the reality is you're supposed to pray without ceasing. You're supposed to be aware of God Every moment of every day. And that only happens if you're willing to approach him with fear and trembling and say, I better pay attention to him. He redeemed me, which is a term used for buying a slave out of slavery and moving to freedom. He bought, he bought me out of slavery, and I, I still act like I'm a slave. And I don't really belong to him, and I could do whatever I want. I could live the way I want. I could dabble with the things of this world and still be set apart. God, you will sanctify it and let him be your fear, trembling at him. Messiah came at the season of redemption, the season of Passover. He was, he was resurrected on first fruits. On first fruits. First fruits happens on the first day 
the day after the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. So tomorrow is technically first fruits, Bikorim. He, he was resurrected on first fruits to, to redeem us from the curse so we can come into that redemption. So we become redeemed. Now you're a redeemed people. Take that seriously because God takes that seriously. He didn't redeem you so you could live the way you want and be comfortable. Nothing comfortable about serving God. The Roman con congregation was a mess. It was a mess. It's the first congregation in the Bible that didn't have a Jewish leader because the emperor had thrown all the Jews out of Rome. You see that in the book of Acts. And then they got these weird ideas that, you know, God is through with the Jews and he's going to use us. It's the first time that happened was in Rome. And, and Paul wrote this letter saying, you, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. Because what happens, in new, if you it's just no, no history, a new, a new emperor, what do they call him, Caesar, a new Caesar came to power and said, ah, Jews come back. So the believers went back and said, we're back. And they said, well, that's okay. God's done with you. And Paul says, what? Has God cast away his people? He knew, God forbid. I'm one of them. Right? That's what this is about. But he's talking to people about the seriousness of God's redemption in this. He's gone through their mistake of God has not forsaken Israel. God forbid I am Israel. And he knew that would be a not politically correct thing, and there's going to be a struggle with what that means in chapter 13, verse 12. He's, uh, he's adjuring them. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Put off the words, works of darkness, and put on the armor of light. Don't spend your time arguing about religion arguing about theology, arguing about whether I'm more saved, less saved, more loved, less loved. I'm in, you're out, and we're competing to see be who, who, who can be more, more religious. And it's like he put away the works of darkness. God loves me more than he loves you. God doesn't like you anymore. He chose me. He used to be the chosen. Now I'm the chosen. You know what? It's all about God. It's not all about us. The, the night is almost gone. In the night, there's darkness, and the darkness of this world is, is, is real, and it's in front of your eyes. Put off the works of darkness. I can't go anywhere and pretend like I'm not wholly separated to God. I can't go anywhere and just pretend like it's okay. I'm part of the world. You don't have to worry about my presence because if people aren't worrying about who you are when they walk into the room, then there's a problem. And the problem isn't with them because people are free to reject God, but we are in God and we are not free to accept relationship with those who reject God. Put on the armory of light. The next verse says, let us rock properly as in the day you're in the, you're in the night but walk properly as in the day just like you you're in the world but you're not of the world you're in the night walk properly as in the day not in carousing hanging out with somebody not in drunkenness not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, not in envy. Those are the works of darkness. Those are the works of the Lord. You say, yes, but I can do this because this is fun to me. People don't fall into sin. They jump into sin. They sin because sin can be fun for me for the moment. I fall into sin because that looks like fun for the moment. And that's okay. God will understand my special circumstance. I'm redeemed. He'll work out this mess for me too. I'll just jump into this puddle and play. God, I'm redeemed. God will take care of it. Be very, very careful. Let's walk properly as in the day. The things that God takes seriously are things that we tend not to take seriously. Carousing, drunkenness, sexual 
promiscuity, sensuality, strife, envy. Put those away. Instead, verse 14, instead put on Lord, the Lord Messiah Yeshua, and stop making provision for the flesh and its craving. But, but I like this. I don't care what you like. I care about your understanding that God didn't come in, this, in, in, in this Messiah to make you comfortable. He came to make you holy, and you just can't go there. You cannot go there. You, you have a free gift, work it out with fear and trembling. You have a relationship with God. Be very careful what you do. You can't cast your pearls before swine. You know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, if you're redeemed, get redeemed as much as possible. Be with peace with all people as much as possible. Some people don't want to be at peace with me. Don't, don't, don't give any provision to the flesh for its cravings. But, but, but my flesh, I want this. I want this. This is something I want. You know, if you listen to television, I only want this. I need this. You watch any of the commercial, you need this. And they want your flesh to say, oh, I want this. I need this. Do you have any teenagers? No offense against teenagers because you're all normal. I'm talking about the worldly teenagers. See something, I have to have these, this pair of shoes. Does, I don't want shoes that fit. It has to be these kind of shoes. I have to have this kind of purse. I have to have this. I have to have that. I need, I want, I want. Don't, don't stop making provision for the flesh. I'm, people are getting uncomfortable. Good. <laughs> because you're crave, if you crave after anything but God, you are falling short of the high mark of the calling of God. Do you understand that? If you crave after anything but God, something's m missing in your life. You're missing the mark of the high calling of God. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot of the kingdom. Don't be unstable. Either be in the kingdom or be in the world. And you, you should be in both, but you should only be of one. See, I could be in the kingdom and be in the world, but I can't be of the kingdom and of the world. At the same time, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, Paul writes. Corinthians, the worldly congregation. Paul was here for a couple years trying to straighten out this mess. Uh, do you have Corinthians? Second uh, Corinthians 10, 3. We walk, though we walk in the flesh, we, we do not wage war according to the flesh. See, there's the key. You're walking in the flesh because this is what we are. I'm walking in the flesh, but I'm not at war according to the flesh. I can't because my flesh is weak. My flesh has cravings and wants and needs. Oh, I want this. I need this. No, we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful through God for the tearing down of strongholds. We are tearing down false arguments. People say, "Can it really hurt?" Did I like this? And it's okay. And I said, "It's not okay. It's not okay." But I have a desire for this. God created me to want this. You can want all you like, but you got to take that thought captive. You will live a holy lifestyle. It's one of the realities we face. Uh, no, I don't want to go down that path. All right. I just want to give you an example. And God said, don't. People said, God created me to want this desire. I want, I want, I want, I crave. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm not going to fight that in my flesh because of the, the weapons are, I didn't move yet, Joni. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshy but powerful. You see, my weapons are powerful. 
powerful. I wage war at a spiritual level. I have a new neurosurgeon. I'm going to see him Monday again. Number seven. And he looked at my MRI and he put it up on the screen. He said, how can you be so active with that back? Because he looked at my spine and it's like, whoa. <laughs> Everyone says it. Like my... And he said, I don't understand how you. I said, here, it's a real simple thought. I could be inactive with that back or I could be active with that back. I choose to be active with that back because my other choice is to be inactive with that back. So I choose to be active. The back's still there. Does it hurt when you're active? Yes. Does it hurt when you're inactive? Yes. But you see, my weapons are powerful through God for the tearing down of strongholds and tearing down these false arguments. Go ahead, Joni. And every high-minded thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Messiah. And here's that, what I want you to see. I, I have a broken back. I don't, and, and please don't be offended by what I'm about to say. I'm not one of those faith people that says, my back's not broken because my MRI is just a picture. No, that's my back. It really is that bad. You see, that's the reality, but I have the truth. Now I'm going to take that thought captive because, you know, you can put my MRI up on a big screen and all of you with untrained arms, eyes could say, ooh, that doesn't look right. But here's the reality. Yes, that's the, real, that's the reality. And the reality is real, but the truth is pure. And the truth is Messiah, and I have Messiah, which at this point in time has not done anything to take away my broken back. My back's a mess. It's quite painful, but that, you know, God is good. I take every thought captive. I'm not going to let that. I came in today. I was thinking about teaching sitting down because I was weak and I'm sick, but I just can't. I can't do that when the anointing is on me and I want to, to encourage you about things of God, although I'm not feeling 100% right now. But see, I have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. This is an analytical letter. This is a Greek letter. It's analytical. And he's, he's, he's drawing a connection. I'm taking control of everything in warfare. Everything that goes and exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is okay if I like it. It's okay if I like it. You know, it's never okay. I don't care whether you like it or not. And why should I have to take every thought captive to the Messiah, the rest of the sentence. Greedy to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Ready, excuse me, that's the sixth. He's ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. He, he, I have to do this because I have to live according to the obedience of Messiah who is ready to punish all disobedience. Would Yeshua really punish me for disobedience? Yes, because he loves me and he doesn't want me to walk in disobedience because it takes away the blessing in my life. It doesn't take away my salvation. It takes away all the blessing into my life. And I, am, I, got, I get spoke as, and I feel guilty and my, my mind is pulling against my spirit. My mind is trying to justify something that I like and the spirit is saying no, 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 no. Whenever your obedience is complete, you can walk in a way that is not going to pull against you. Doesn't always solve the problem. But Messiah didn't come to make you comfortable. He came to make you holy. And God is so real for us. Messiah is so real. He said, in the world you have tribulation. Be cheerful. 
So you had to say that. Why can't you just take the tribulation away? And it's easier to be cheerful. You say, no, no, in the world you're going to have tribulation. Just be cheerful. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Galatians, which is another Greek congregation, it was the first congregation that, 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 that where people, people in the congregation started bringing people into the congregation. That didn't used to happen. That started in, 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 in uh, Galatians. It, it, it started in Antioch, but this, this is a big thing in Galatia. And they have the same problem of everybody. You've got to stop walking according to flesh. Brothers and sisters, you were called to freedom. There's the good news. You're called to freedom, yes. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the flesh. You're called to freedom. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I can do anything when I'm free. No freedom is not a license to do anything you want. You're called to freedom. Don't let your freedom become an opportunity for your flesh. Because I'm free, my, my flesh can go do what it wants. No. Through love, serve one another. Serve one another. Get along with one another. One of the greatest blessings we have in this congregation is you are you are able to fellowship with one another in spite of the mess that people have in the in a conglomeration of people that, that, that are part of this ministry. You're, you're a peculiar group of people. Most congregations do not have this peculiar a gathering. You're supposed to all be on one page. And I say, hey, if we can get close to the same book, we're doing good. And the next verse, the whole Torah is summed up in a single saying, love your neighbor as yourself. The whole Torah can be summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. God gave us Torah because he loved us. The Torah came to teach us how to love each other because God is our creator God. We need to love one another. But, next verse, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out, you are not destroyed by one another. You, you, you start sniping at one another. Somebody starts, gets out of place, something, this isn't perfect, I want it perfect, I want this, I want that, I want something else, I expected this, I expected this. He said, quit, quit biting and devouring one another. Go to the next verse. But I say, walk by the ruach, walk by the breath. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. How can I walk in this world without walking according to my flesh? I walk by the, by the ruach, by the breath of God, by the Spirit of God. If I walk by the Spirit, I don't carry out the desires of my flesh. There's a war in me, and the next verse explains that. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, the Ruach, but the Ruach sets its desire against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. You cannot do what you want. You cannot do what you want because your flesh wants one thing, and the Spirit says, no. But my flesh wants this. I want this. I need this. And the Spirit says, no. The flesh sets its desires against the Ruach. The Ruach sets its desires against the flesh. They are in opposition to one another. First Peter 2.11, a Jewish letter. So it's just out, it's allegorical. It's not analytical. It's a real simple thought. Love when I urge you as strangers and soldiers, keep away from the fleshly cravings that war against the soul. That's how he says it. Paul gives this, this is going on, this, 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 this. And Peter says, as strangers and sojourners, you're here, but you're not here. Keep away from fleshly cravings that work into the soul. That's an easy way to, to say what Paul says in a chapter. He's just a simple Galilean fisherman. Keep away from fleshly cravings that work against the flesh. He said in, in a simple way, 
what Paul wrote in a chapter. Stepping it out. This is why. This and this. This this and this. this. And he says, don't, don't be fleshly. Be spiritual. And, 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 and you know, what do you, what do you do with the Torah? If you look for the Torah to righteousness, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. The Torah will kill you. I'm Torah observant. Ooh, I'm not. I don't even tr- pretend like I try to be. I can't, cannot be. So I throw out the Torah. No, the Torah, as a matter of fact, it's my next verse. Go to Romans 7, 11. We know the Torah is spiritual. The Torah is spiritual. Ter- Torah is good. I'm bad. Torah is spiritual, but I'm the flesh. I'm, my flesh is so sin. Paul is not saying, I'm sold to sin. Paul says, my flesh is sold to sin. Next verse, I don't understand what I am doing. What I do not want, this I practice. What I hate, this I do. The world's, world's inside of me. But next verse, if I, if I, <coughs> excuse me. If I do what I do not want to do, then I agree with the Torah. It's good. The Torah is good. I know the Torah is good because it shows me how bad I am. And it continues in verse 70. So now it's no longer I doing it, but sin dwelling in me. It's an analytical thought if you follow it through. I'm struggling. I'm not struggling. My flesh is struggling. It's no longer I that am doing it. Sin is dwelling in me, in my flesh. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For to will it. For to will is present with me, but to do good is not. I want to do what's right. I just don't. Verse 19, for the good I want to do, I do not do the evil that I do not want. This I practice. Why? Anytime I live according to flesh, my flesh wants this. My flesh needs this. this my flesh says this is good. This, this makes my flesh feel good. And God said, I don't want you to feel good. I want you to be holy. But we struggle with these things that are inside of us. And he's continuing an analytical treatise. If I do not, if, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I, that's not verse, yeah, it is. It's when sin that dwells within me. So, in a summation of the analytical thought, I find this principle. Evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. I want to do what's right. I just don't. For I delight in the Torah of God with respect to the inner man. I love the Bible. I read the Bible every day. I love the Bible. My wife devours the Bible. We love the Bible. Oh, we love the Bible. But I see a different law in my body parts. Next verse, Joni. Uh, be battling against the law of my mind and bringing me in bondage under the law of sin, which is in my body parts. In other words, I think I want to walk in the perfectness of the revelation of God in me. My flesh just wants what my flesh wants and tears that thought down. Verse, next verse, miserable man that I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Who can, who can rescue us from this struggle that goes on within us? And then he answers the question in the next verse. Thanks be to God. It is through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So then, my mind, I serve the Torah of God. With my flesh, I serve the law of sin. You know, the good news is there is a battle inside of you. That means God is working on you. If you are not struggling with your relationship with God, I challenge you because you don't have a relationship with God. Because you had a relationship with God, there would be a struggle inside of you about the holiness of God in you because that's a free gift, but you got to work that with fear and trembling. This God is real. If, you're, if you say, ah, God's not bothering me, I challenge you because you don't think God is real. Because if God is real and God is with you, you should be changing. And the battle is, is inside of me. How, how redeemed are we? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes, I'm redeemed, but how redeemed are we? 
and, and, and Yeshua was teaching to the crowds up in the Galilee in, in, in Matthew 7. And he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Not everyone who calls Yeshua Lord will make it. Well, if he's our Lord, aren't we in? Aren't we redeemed if he brings us out of Egypt? And to me, something that should frighten you is what he says next. Many will say to me in that day. Many will say to Messiah in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive demons out in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? And you're not even doing that. Then Messiah says, I would declare to you, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. But I did all these things lawless. Lawless. Many will say, didn't I serve you? Now the promise that, God, that Messiah made to us in John 6, 6 was that if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Freedom does not give you a license to practice fleshly desires. Freedom does not give you the option of practicing fleshly desires. It sets up a war. And if you're not warring against your flesh, you got a problem because none of us uh, are walking out. How redeemed are we? How redeemed are we? Does it, aren't we free because of Messiah? Galatians 5.1 points out, for freedom Messiah sent us free. So stand firm and do not be burdened by the yoke of slavery again. God redeemed you out of slavery. Stand firm. Don't be burdened by the yoke of slavery. God redeemed me. I'm going to put on the yoke of slavery again. Yes, I'm redeemed, but I'm, my flesh wants something, so I just go back into slavery. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slave who was redeemed, but chooses to go back to slavery. A dog returns to its own vomit. Redemption is a free gift. It's a free gift. I, last night, I, 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 I gave the invitation, because I think it's appropriate to give the invitation. Anyone who has never accepted the atoning work of the Messiah, the redemptive work of the Messiah, you need to, to, to receive the re redemption work of Messiah. If you don't understand how it works, Messiah came to set us free. But if you did, like me, I have allowed, I've accepted the Messiah. Yeshua is my Messiah. I am, re I am redeemed totally to God because of Messiah. And I come to God in Messiah, and I live in Messiah, reconciled to God. And I have to stand firm in that with fear and trembling. This is a serious thing because I cannot be burdened by the yoke of slavery again. And if I succumb to the flesh because my flesh wants this, like some of you, my flesh wanted to stay in bed this morning. Like some of you, you understand that. You know, the alarm went off. I said, you've got to be kidding. I have to get up and get dressed and slept all the way after you survived last night. And I had to do it knowing that as soon as I'm finished here, Larry and I are going to pack up the truck and head out to Bay Yeshua and do, do another Seder this afternoon. <coughs> and we'll be over there till sometime this evening. Uh, it's like, well, I'd like to, guys, but I, I don't really feel up to it. And you know what? I, 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 I don't feel up to it. I don't feel up to it right now. Just like you came here not really feeling up to coming here. Do you know how many people stayed home because it's easier to stay home than to drag yourself in here? It takes a lot of effort just to drag yourself into here. That's true of me. That's true of everyone on the stage here, everyone on the stage back there. You have to overcome just to show up to a service. But it's a battle that we face every day in our lives, and just being here is a battle. And if you're living on a mountaintop instead of in the valley, that's good. Because at any given time, somebody's going to be on a mountaintop while somebody is in the valley. We can look at you and say, wow, it is possible. And then the next time, maybe I'm going to be on the mountaintop and you're going to be in the valley. 
And you can look and say, wow, that it's possible. We don't all live in the valley. We don't all live on the mountain. But we all have to struggle to truly be holy, to be used our God and take the free gift of redemption and work without fear and trembling. Be blessed, everybody. Shabbat shalom. If you would like to receive ministry, I invite the Ruach ministry teams.